and Tiffany, Tiffany and Penelope, you can see my PowerPoint. Yes. Okay. Let's see here. All right. All right. Without further ado, welcome everyone to this session on artists and decolonizing literacies. We are so glad to have you today. A big welcome to you, all of our virtual guests. Thank you so much for being a part of this session. Uh, I just want to make a note at the top that in order to make time for a Q&A today, this session will move, will move beyond 1230. Let's just say we'll end roughly at 1 o'clock. Feel free to come and go as you please, but just know that for your schedules. For today, we have artists, uh, Ebony Bailey, Life Between Borders, Black Migrants in Mexico. We have Invisible Roots by Tiffany Walton Medwa and Liz Mullis. We have Water by Penelope Louder. These are the three films that we will be sharing today. Special guest, Ebony Bailey, I wanna read to you a little bit from her bio. In this short documentary, we'll meet Haitians stuck at the border, as well as Africans in Mexico City to explore black migration and identity in Mexico. Ebony shot, edited, and produced the documentary. Uh, a little bit about Ebony, she describes herself as a black Blackxican, a filmmaker and photographer from Central California, whose work explores cultural intersections and the diaspora. Her films have screened at festivals and forums in the US, Mexico, and Europe, her photos have appeared in NPR and LA Times. She was awarded the Samuel L. Coleman Scholarship at the Haiti International Film Festival and was selected for the Tomorrow's Filmmakers Today program by HBO and the Ola Mexico Film Festival. She studied journalism at USC and is completing her master's in documentary film at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Thank you so much for for Ebony Bailey. Glad to have you. Hi. Hello. <laughs> oh, all right. Ebony Bailey is in the house. Yes. <laughs> yes, I was about I was about to be your substitute. All right. <laughs> Glad to have you. Are you in Mexico? Yeah, I'm in Mexico. I have issues with my computer, so I'm on my iPad, but I think I can okay. still share things. Uh-huh. Well, let's see. Nolan, can you make Ebony a co-host, please? Nolan, can you make Ebony a co-host so she can share her screen? And Plan B, I can always share it from my screen too. But it's your film, and I want you to to do to do the work. Okay, thank okay. you. All right, thank you. Next up, we have Tiffany Walton Madwa, Invisible Roots: Afro Mexicans in Southern California. This documentary highlights the history, culture, and lives of Afro-Mexicans from the Costa Chica area of Mexico or with ties to the region living in Southern California. Also, Invisible Roots examines the history of Mexicans of African descent and what it means to physically look Black, but culturally and ethnically identify as Mexican, oftentimes in the face of opposition. Uh, a little bit more about Tiffany. She's currently a copywriter for an international digit digital marketing agency. However, in 2015, while earning her MA in specialized journalism at the University of Southern California, she produced the documentary Invisible Roots, Afro-Mexicans in Southern California. This documentary highlights the history, culture, and lives of Afro-Mexicans from the Costa Chica area of Mexico or with ties to the region living in Southern California. She first became familiar with Afro-Mexicans as a teen after viewing Tony Gleaton's photography of the African presence in Mexico. Later, she read an article in the LA Times by John Mitchell about Afro-Mexicans living in Southern California and wanted to learn their stories. A big welcome for Tiffany. Thank you so much. Tiffany, any other, any other things, anything else I need to add? Anything else you want to add? Yeah, just very happy to be here and to share. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. And we have special guest Penelope Louder with water. What will we do without that water, right? We protect that water. We need yeah. that water for sustenance. We yeah. need that water in this pandemic, right? Yeah. What would happen if they hoard that water? 
So Penelope is a playwright, screenwriter, and novelist. Some of her many works include The Unseen, Reaching Autonomy, and A, and a Drop of Sun. Her plays have been produced in New York and LA. Louder's most recent film, 15 Minutes, premiered at the 2020 Pan-African Film Festival. Three Seconds of Hell is an adaptation of her debut novel, Three Seconds of Hell, the story of her father's experiences in a 1950s Southern motorcycle gang. My oh my, I bet <laughs> the stories you have to tell. Yes, and he survived it. He survived. I know I'm from down south too, I understand. Louder is a current member of Skylight Playwrights Lab. She's a recipient of the Marvin Miller Screenwriting Fellowship and the LA Theater Center Playwrights Residency. Louder holds a bachelor's degree in theater from the University of Southern California. She teaches writing at USC through the Community Literature Intensive Program. Additionally, she serves as a playwriting mentor to at-risk youth in South LA. Louder reside, resides in LA and Louder's play, West Adams, was also selected as an LA Times Critics' Choice for its production at Skylight Theater in 2020. Let's give it up for everybody. Yes. And Miss Louder, do you have any uh, any other words to say beyond the bio? Any anything else you'd like no, to add? That, that was perfect. Nothing to add. All right. Be here. Thank you so much for that. And now we turn to Ebony Bailey and she's going to share her screen and share with us 15 minutes of the documentary Life Between Borders, Black Migrants in Mexico. And Ebony, the screen sharing is all yours. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to do this on my iPad, but do you want? I have I have your uh, film already queued up. Do you want me to share it from my screen? Yeah, could you? Because okay, I think I might. <laughs> it's not okay. I... Thank you. You're welcome. Everybody ignore my desk. My desktop is a mess. It's the life of a professor. Pray for me. All right, here we go. Ese camino fue un camino que todos nosotros sabemos lo que es significar dolor. ¿Cómo tú se sentirías que tú escuchas que tu, tu hermano está atravesando una selva para buscar la vida mejor? directamente para quedar aquí en México. Más México. <ríe> Estoy pensando, maestro. 40 para quedar aquí, 60% entrar para allá. Si sí, la situación en el estado de está, está, está bien, parece difícil. No tengo, no tengo problema para quedar en México. La verdad es una nueva migración. Es un fenómeno nuevo que está viviendo México. Con la llegada de Donald Trump al poder, entonces ahorita le gusta mucho trabajo para ellos y también después de la decisión que fue tomada Obama el 22 de septiembre de este año, eh, suspendió la visa humanitaria. Por eso hoy en día están varados eh, los haitianos. no habíamos tenido este, personas de África o de Haití. Antes había aproximadamente ocho, este, ocho albergues en Tijuana y ahorita hay 28. Los nuevos albergues emergentes que, que se han habilitado han sido iglesias, sobre todo iglesias cristianas de diferentes denominaciones que han abierto sus puertas. El problema es que ellos han atendido esta situación que en realidad le corresponde al gobierno 
y, y al final pues los han dejado sin recursos. Ellos tienen problemas en aliar y salud, hay bastantes habitaciones donde hay chinches y aparte en área de salud no hay condiciones de higiene, niños y mujeres embarazadas, todos están viviendo juntos. Es inhumano tenerlo, tener a la gente viviendo en estas condiciones. Tiene que haber lineamientos y apoyo del gobierno. Pasaba tres años en Brasil y después de tres años Brasil tiene crisis, crisis no tiene trabajo y como tiene un paso, un paso para venir a México, yo paso ocho países. Para Colombia y Panamá fue el camino más difícil, la gente debería pasar eh, la floresta, Costa Rica no fue fácil también y está cerrada la frontera con Nicaragua. De ahí ya, como dice el traficante, de persona, la gente paga hasta 1.200 dólares para pasar a Nicaragua. Realmente es un milagro Dios este, llegar a la frontera norte. La presencia africana en México es una presencia muy antigua, desde este, ya más de cinco siglos, ¿no? Y es una presencia que dio a, a este país a, lo que se llama la tercera raíz. Es decir, que en muchos mexicanos hay algo que es parte de África. Hay dos tipos de de familias que llegaron aquí en el tiempo de la esclavitud, ¿no? Y otros que llegamos después. Muchos uh, africanos que llegan aquí estudian, como yo, se quieren a trabajar y se casan con mexicanos y tienen hijos. Definitivamente que ser en México como mujer negra es una cosa complicada porque, bueno, al ser mujer te discriminan por eso. Pero al ser negra sufres una doble discriminación. Mi padre llegó a México en los 70 en un intercambio estudiantil que existió entre el gobierno y el gobierno de varios países africanos. Y bueno, fue la primera ocasión que el gobierno abrió las puertas para que estudiantes africanos En unas ocasiones me ha tocado que alguna persona cree que soy mexicana. Lo primero que las personas hacen cuando se me acercan es preguntarme por mi nacionalidad. Ha sido difícil porque desde que algunos profesores consideran que no tengo derecho a tener educación, que no tengo derecho a estar en una escuela pública. Hay gente que por, discrimina un poquito, pero por ignorancia, por desconocimiento, pero no es por, por violencia o por una cosa de agresión. Pero es curioso porque aquí no hay mucho negro. ¿no? Creo que en México la comida de matriz africana está invisibilizada. Es importante porque como el gobierno ha invisibilizado todos los aportes culturales y muchos otros, ¿no? De las personas negras en México, el hecho de que las personas coman y no sepan de dónde proviene es una negación de lo que son, porque finalmente somos lo que comemos. Las personas en México generalmente no alcanzan a entender muy bien eh, lo que queremos hacer, pero en cuanto ven la comida encuentran ciertas similitudes con comidas, por ejemplo, de las postres. Entonces, creo que la comida de matriz africana está tan, no, ha permeado tanto en la gastronomía mexicana eh, que finalmente el paladar del público mexicano este, es abrazado fácilmente por este tipo de comida. 
mi pintura tiene un estilo africano, figurativo, estilizado. Los mexicanos son de porque como es un país muy grande, todo aquí se mueven aquí, ¿no? No tienen mucho contacto con Europa y con África mucho menos, ¿no? Hay mucha gente mexicana que aprecia el arte africano. Y sí, es importante como es para acercar las culturas, tanto la cultura mexicana, latina, como la cultura africana, ¿no? Es un acercamiento. ¿Le recomendaría a todas aquellas, bueno, todas aquellas personas que están llegando a México que para poder protegerse o ponerse menos en riesgo a manos de, por ejemplo, federales de caminos, ejército, policía, eh, lleguen sus derechos? No sé nada de aquí en, en México. Para, para conocer la vida aquí en México, tiene que comenzar a trabajar y cómo comenzar a comprar. Como nosotros aquí, todo el mundo es da comida, no paga casa. Ahora yo está, está trabajando, pero cuando me llegan aquí yo no estaba haciendo nada. Sí, como yo tengo comedor y ya trabajando ahora, construcción civil. Yo responsable de la comida eh, para, para hacer desayuno para ellos para impartir dinero, eh, eh, comida para ellos y como yo, yo, yo sé la costumbre, la costumbre de mis paisanos y así que Arturo y su esposo, esposa me encarga para las cosas. Yo quería hacer una carrera porque todavía está pensando para entrar para allá pero si me quedo aquí yo voy a hacer carrera ese que me pienso yo, ingeniería sí. Pero... Cuando yo estaba en Haití, mi actividad era profesor, profesor de matemática, física y química hasta final. No tengo problema para hacer cualquier cosa, más solo yo quiero una, una vida mejor. No es eh, como yo, yo, eh, como yo soy apóstol, yo soy eh, profesor, no. Yo puedo hacer to, eh, cualquier cosa, cualquier cosa. Aquí cuando nosotros acordamos, siempre levantamos y damos a todos buen día, como estaba. Ahí cocinamos, comimos y comenzamos. Ahí está paja, y ahí, disculpa por esta palabra. Ahí ha ah, hecho, tú sabes, chismoso, chis, hace chisme de otras personas, se ríen o jogan un dominó, algo así, o fuimos allá afuera, caminando un poco, pero no tanto. Porque para nosotros, ellos nos abrazan aquí en Tijuana, pero no tanto. Porque saben que tenemos un balance, 50% cada uno. Como están en albergues, pues sí están un poco como en su propia comunidad, ¿no? pero depende de dónde estén. Si están en un albergue muy aislado es un poco más difícil. Los que están en el centro sí hemos visto que se integran más, ¿no? van a los restaurantes, los puedes ver en las plazas, pero en realidad una verdadera integración, pues es un poco difícil porque no se están quedando aquí. ¿no? Creo que la integración ya real sería cuando, cuando empiecen a ir a la escuela, cuando empiecen a trabajar. Si algunas personas deciden quedarse aquí, creo que va a ser muy enriquecedor para tanto musicalmente, gastronómicamente, ya se ha visto que ahorita está de moda comer el, el pollo haitiano, no sé, el platillo. Entonces creo que por la parte cultural y, y humana es, es algo muy positivo, ¿no? Desafortunadamente siempre va a haber pues ignorancia y xenofobia y es como algo nuevo. No creo que no creo que lo estén tomando de manera racista, pero sí hace falta educarlos mucho. Porque hacer talleres y hacer eventos eh, para el público mexicano. Eh, 
sobre estas temáticas de lo negro y de lo africano. Es importante cambiar la mirada del otro uh, para que el otro entienda uh, que el negro no es un subhumano. Hasta ahorita no veo como un rechazo como tal por parte de Baja Californianos contra a nuestros hermanos eh, migrantes afrodescendientes. Ese, ese fenómeno nuevo eh, podría convertir al futuro eh, algo nuevo en qué sentido ampliar un poquito más la cultura africana más en nuestro país. México es un país multicultural. Hablar de la cultura mexicana tiene que ver con la cultura africana. Le diría a toda la gente negra que está llegando a México que no se desespere. Que el problema es somos negros porque la migración europea no incomoda. Esa es bienvenida. La migración blanca siempre es bienvenida. No es un problema. La migración negra siempre lo va a hacer. Entonces, que no se desesperen, que no bajen la cabeza, que trabajen duro. Finalmente, el dinero es una consecuencia del trabajo. ¿no? Y el bienestar también es una consecuencia del trabajo. Les va a costar, sí. Pero al final, vale la pena. Como en México es un país que tiene más oportunidad que Haití, porque todo el mundo sabe que Haití es un país pobre, es un país que tiene mucha dificultad. Y aquí en México, yo, yo pienso que la vida va mejor para nosotros. Yo agradezco a mis amigos, todo el día que está viendo un carro aquí, esa ayuda es bastante porque ellos ven aquí todos los días. Para nosotros, Tijuana, Tijuana va a estar aquí siempre en nuestra, en nuestra cabeza. All right, thank you very much for that piece, Ebony. We, uh, uh, audience, I want you to know we're going to show the films back to back to back. And so whatever questions you may have, please hold off until the Q&A uh, so that way we have enough time to show all of our films. The next, and yes, please, Harold Lloyd to everyone powerful, thank you. Please fill up the chat room with your, your comments. Um, next, we wanna go to Miss Tiffany Walton Medua, Invisible Roots, Afro-Mexicans in Southern California. This is from 2015. This particular um, film is 21 minutes. So the last film was about 15. And then Water with Miss Penelope Louder, that piece is about 15 minutes, just to give you an idea of our time here today. So without further ado, Tiffany, I, I Turn it over to you to share with us Invisible Roots, Afro-Mexicans in Southern California. Can you see my, let me see. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect, okay. Let me get this situated a little bit.
Aquí cuando llegué yo aquí, la mayoría no pensaba, porque como conozco muchos mexicanos y como juegos, jugaba, juego soccer, me, me dicen, ¿de dónde eres? Le digo, mexicano. Le dice, ah, no, en serio. Le digo, sí, soy mexicano. Le dice, no, tú no eres mexicano, eres centroamericano. Le digo, no, soy mexicano. Le dice, ¿por qué estás negando que eres centroamericano? Le digo, no, yo soy mexicano, ¿por qué voy a mentir en algo que no tengo? ¿Por qué mentir? Eh, también, eh, por ejemplo, en mi trabajo me preguntan de dónde eres, también americanos o a veces también afro afro de Ya que, pues allá la gente cuando salíamos, lo que es la parte de la costa, cuando uno sale a la ciudad, a la, a la ciudad de México, luego, por ejemplo, los propios policías te preguntan, hey, ¿de dónde eres? Uh -huh. Eh, tú no eres mexicano, dame tus papeles. O a veces te, 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 te hacen cantar el himno nacional. I get that all the time, yeah. I'm like, you're Mexican, speak Spanish. And I'm like, no, I don't have to prove myself to you. And that actually happened last, on my last job. I told them I was Mexican, and they're like, speak Spanish. And I'm like, no, I don't have to. So I remember one kid in high school, he would always tell me, you're black, every day, like every day. I had a class with him. And he would tell me, you're black, you're not Mexican. Well, they ask me where I am, I'm Mexican, and they say that I'm from here, but I'm not Mexican. I've had experiences where they assume I'm black, just assume I'm mixed. You tell them I'm Mexican, they're like, are you sure? Like, are you sure? <laughs> just assuming. If I would see him walking down the street, yeah, I wouldn't think he was a Mexican. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what? I would think that she was a Mexican say in Spanish. He would think I'm the prettiest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't. <laughs> I grew up thinking I was Mexican, like full Mexican, like no black in me, you know? So like being in the 99% um, Latino community, like because of my like, The way I look, they never thought I was like Mexican. So they would always like associate with me negatively because they, you know, black culture, like everybody, like not everybody, but it's like main society that people kind of like look down upon like black people, you know, and stuff like that. So before people would ask me and like, at first I'd be like, yeah, I'm Mexican. And they would always give me the, oh no, you're not. Like, okay, if you're Mexican, speak Spanish to me. Like, can I okay, how, translate to this in Spanish and then give me a line and be like, I want it like in Spanish perfectly. And if I would like mess up a little bit, be like, ah, you know, I'd be like certain stuff like that. So it got to a point where when people would ask me, I would be like, oh yeah, I'm black. And they'd leave it, leave it at that. So it got to a point where I would just say I'm black because that was the easiest thing, you know? afro mexicano Yeah, see? Descendiente, yo diría. afro mexicano afro mexicano Hispana. <laughs> I just think of myself as Hispanic. American. Hispanic. Hispanic. Oh, I'm Hispanic too. I'd rather call, consider myself Afro-Mexican just because Chicano people are going to be like, oh, you're from Mexico. Like, what? You look dark. My mother was uh, biracial. African American and Mexican. So her father was African American from Texas. Her mother was Mexican from Sinaloa. Historically, the Afro Mexicans migrated north. So you had people like Pio Pico. And so Pio Pico was a businessman, but he was also the last Mexican governor of California. He was of African ancestry. And he came from, his family came from Rosario. And that was a town that was mostly black. Uh, it was, and it's one of the regions where the settlers of Los Angeles came from in 1781. So that group of settlers that had actually walked up from Mexico and they arrived in 1781, half of them were Afro-Mexican. Uh, and what's really interesting is that a lot of young African-American scholars are very interested in the subject. 
um, and some young Mexican American scholars. I know that uh, Africans were imported, African slaves were imported into Mexico uh, in the 1500s, and they were pretty much taken to uh, various parts of Mexico during the colonial period. Uh, and there is a lot of folks who have African ancestry in Michoacan, but are unaware. Last year, I, I ended up taking a genetic test, and sure enough, the African ancestry came up uh, in my in my gene pool, right? Uh, and that's when I became a little more interested, and I wanted to know more about my black ancestry. You know, it was a it was a conversation that I didn't know how to start because uh, you know the, the people my family over there, I don't think they're aware of that as well, uh, because uh, the reason why is because I don't think anybody's just African or just black. There is the mixture that happened all over Mexico, right? You know, the, the culture in our, in our town is different from the rest of Mexico. The language is kind of different. We have a different accent. We have different words. Uh, uh, everything is, is different. You know, you, when you are there, you know, you don't realize that you are different. But as, soon as, as soon as you get out of, of that town, you realize like, oh, we kind of different. There are a lot of carryovers, African carryovers, uh, such as in the food, uh, in the dance. Tamales. Oh, these okay. are. This is the pollo de pollo. Pollo. These are the chicken. The chicken tamales. They're pretty hot. So we use the banana leaves and um, the chicken tamales. Yeah. So we just eat it. <laughs> yeah. We put milo in it. Chicken, the sauce and a little bit of lard, of course. And then we just wrap them up and then we just let it sit there for three hours. Three hours. Three hours. About three hours. Mm -hmm. Those are the spices. And then there's some, uh, there's other places that they put corn and they put cheese and we don't really, really um, do them like that unless they are ordered. But we mostly, mostly um, focus on the chicken and pork that we don't put the extra stuff. But yes, they are different, different types of tamales. We have more traditions as Mexicans and more as Blacks. They get a different taste from the, comparing it to the corn leaf. They get a different taste, it's more. This one with more of the juice, so it gives them more flavor. Thank you, Thank you. Than the corn leaf. Same. My parents are from Mexico, Guadalupe, Guerrero. I say I'm Mexican, 100% Mexican. And yes, I'm dark skinned because we're from the coast from Mexico, where Guerrero is at, the Costa, Costa Chica, that's what they call it. They call it. Um, but I do consider myself Mexican, and I am quite familiar that I have some African in me, but I'm not sure why or how it happened. I just have an idea. This is my mom, my lovely mother. Oh, we, she, we have faith in him because every, like we, um, we have a faith in him and, um, he does like miracle stuff. So that's why we, this is a little thing we have for, we, um, usually in Mexico, um, we will dress up as we were going to ride a horse. So we dress up, but since we don't have any horses here, we don't do it here in Santa Ana. But this is a little, we, it's supposed to be over there. I don't know what's doing here. But um, he's a saint, and we pretty much pray to him, um, asking him favors or miracles, and then he'll do them. Like, and then that's what, that's what we do these type of events uh, for a fundraiser. That's what we do these type of events. The food is that's very good food. Yeah. Chilate, the chocolate drink. Yeah, that's something that's um, it's known over there where my parents are from. Like if you go like through through the market, the ladies are selling it there. All of my aunt sells it over there. Like the one I went. It's just I guess you could say like hot chocolate or 
it's comes from, it's made out of from scratch from the cocoa bean. Oh, um, this is um, chicken with some hot sauce, some thick hot sauce actually. Um, it's really known over there. Honestly, I like eating it with quesadillas. Once every month we, we make food and we sell it to raise some money to uh, do the big celebration in August. I enjoy because it's a bit different from other, uh, uh, like other Mexicans. I guess you could say that this is why I like, like what, who I am. Like, I guess we, not dark skin, but this is, we're different from others, other Hispanics, you know? Like we have our dances and stuff like that. And we celebrate this thing. And probably others, other parts of Mexico, they celebrate a different but this one's like where we're from. It's important because it's to not lose the tradition here in the like the people. So we also bring it here to celebrate. A lot of them haven't gone back to their country in years. Like my dad hasn't been there for over 20 years. Yeah. And so this is like a part of them that they miss. The reason I say I'm Hispanic is because I feel that it, like the way I am, like I, I, my first language was Spanish. Um, I know my dad carries traditions like the Diablos, but that's something that I don't really carry because I don't really know exactly like why it's celebrated. Más bien ahí, según se nos ha dicho por los antepasados, ¿no? que proviene precisamente de África, pero que aquí al llegar de esclavo empiezan como ellos mismos en una especie de, de mofa, ¿no? Algo así, como burlándose del, de, de su, de su capataz, donde ellos trabajaban, ¿verdad? Empezaron a danzar también, ¿no? Como que representaba, vamos, el, el Pancho, hay un personaje, ese representaba al capataz, y los demás estaban subordinados a él. La minga, digamos, era la mujer del Pancho, ¿no? que representaba supuestamente a la, a la mujer desde el Pancho, para que junto ahí, pero estaban sometidos a un, a un patrón, y danzaban, pero como una forma de burlarse, ¿no? algo así. ¿no? Era, Más o menos eso yo eh, he entendido un poquito de lo que comentaba. Yo también te decía, el padre este, Israel, Israel Rey de la Red, él comentaba un poco porque él profundizó más en el conocimiento de, de eso de la danza. Mi hijo, que aquí está, han bailado aquí y yo le dio seguimiento Martín Alemán aquí con él, junto con él. Pero ese, ese tinte le daban, ¿no? O sea, que eso es, o sea, vivían en una esclavitud, pues, sometido a alguien. Y una forma de escapar, ¿verdad?, ciertas tensiones, pues era eso, bailando y haciendo, ¿verdad? Ahí. I'm uh, third year at UCSB, Chicago Studies and Back Studies. Well, you can't really see, so I feel like it's whoa. This is where I play. This, so, like, we would come here, like, they have a TV, they have a piano, they have pool tables, and we would just come here and chill. level like you know the way you look like for example me you know being afro-mexican like me being mexican but looking black how has like stereotypes like affected your life like per se you know just like because i know i've been making feel so uncomfortable just because people think i'm black and if i say no i'm mexican if i speak spanish they'll make like either make me recite something or make me do something to prove my like yeah and it's kind of like wait what i even had my mom tell me one time she was like you should be really happy that you have light skin you know like you're really lucky that you have light skin you know i wish i looked more like i don't know just more you know yeah yeah, like Mexican or something, you know? Because then the fact that I don't speak Spanish like makes it worse. Uh, ah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. People always try and like speak Spanish to me, and I'm like, oh, you know, I like I don't even know how to speak it very fluently. So you know, for me, it's always been a struggle because 
like I've been the one to be like shunned because like even though I'm I'm Mexican American, uh, a lot of people claim that I'm not because I don't speak Spanish. So yeah, I mean, I always get that like, oh, you're not real, you're not real Mexican then, or, yeah, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. And you're just like, do you want to go to my family party? Yeah. 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 <laughs> do you want to go back to my house and eat my food? Exactly. exactly. My whole life, like just something so small as me being Mexican like looking black like has stuck in my head and that gets me mad more it's just like i'm probably more mexican than like half of the world you know we do fall in the middle you know like we're not fully like this chicano culture you know but we're not fully this black culture i feel like it's really intermingled you know me being proud of me being black to like kind of boost my self-esteem but before when i didn't know that you know it was just like mexican and that didn't boost my self-esteem because people would always make fun of me, you know, so like I never had the counterpart to boost my self-esteem. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, but I don't hear one, don't you? Well, we were born in Mexico City. Um, we, my mom brought us here since we were little. We grew up in Pasadena. Here when we started school, there weren't that many dark Mexicans. So we did go through a lot of bullying, like people would see us and like, oh, they're the black Mexican girls or yeah. everything. So it did happen a lot because in that time when I was like in elementary school, you didn't see the, that many Afro-Mexicans. It was very rare to see me and for me to tell people I'm Mexican. Be like, no, she's not. They would actually so call, you well, they would call me Pocahontas. <laughs> so it was like... It was weird for us because there weren't that many. And most of the culture that we know now is thanks to all the people that are here now. And because like she said before, they would say, what are you? We'll be like Mexicans. Now we know we're Afro-Mexicans and we know a lot more about it than we used to before. And again, it's thanks to most of the people that are, there's a lot more than before. And it does make you feel more proud because you, you can kind of see where you're coming from now. You're not just a dark Mexican at school. <laughs> I know a couple people from Black City Union, and all of them are like super, super, super like, you cannot budge them on their ideology. Like, they're so like, I'm Black and I'm proud and I'm beautiful and I'm everything, you know, like they're empowered, you know? And I'm just like, I need that empowerment. I need that like ideology. I want to go wherever I go with my head, head up high. I feel like the main thing that's holding me back is just the fact that like, I, my whole life, I've been, like, rejected by Mexican people, like, quote-unquote, my people. You know, my whole life, I've been rejected by them. So, and I feel like Black, like, that Black part of this campus is the only, the only kind of people who I can actually, like, speak to. And I would just hate that if I were to go into such a, like, a space, an area, if, like, I would hate to feel like an outcast. I would hate to relive everything I relived through. But like from like being like from my Mexican like um, companions and stuff like that, you know, just like I would hate to go to a Black Student Union meeting and have like them kind of like, uh, like not look at me, just kind of not pay attention to me, make me feel outcasted, make me feel like I don't belong, you know? I feel like I can't, like, I don't have a place, you know? And I feel like that's just the only thing that's coming back. One of the saddest things that can happen to somebody is not to not know what they are or where they're from. Uh, they're definitely missing out because they, they don't really know who they are. And and a lot of these folks, especially in the grow up in communities where, where being different is, is not okay or, or predominant culture is not theirs, um, they don't have a, a, their self-esteem is low, you know? So knowing who they are, I think I'll say with the confidence and culture. My name is Isander Sanchez. Sita Tarantino. Hector Castro. Hector Castro. Brandy Castro Vargas. My name is Simeon Arvera. Pedro Castañeda. Thank 
can't leave for pimp it up, see how it's sold. Now you don't wanna test me, cheap go. You don't wanna clash, go, miss the least store. Death silence, microphone fill up, blacks to get rhyme like I ain't nobody yell up. When I hit him with that Latin speed, I'll get him out of here to mosh pit, yes indeed. I know your pain, I see your struggle, I'm just like, feel that frustration, desperation, all that little robin stealing. This shit's a ugly, really, cops is saying it's sure and killing. They speak in vain, no shame, it makes me in the fucking city. Well, can we give give Miss Tiffany Walter Medois some type of acknowledgement, acknowledgement, some type of reaction here? Thank you so much. And again, please continue to put your thoughts in the chat in the chat room. We have one more film to share with you, Miss Penelope Louder, with water, and I will be sharing my screen with you for that. Okay. Let's see here. Hold on one second. Let's see here. Let me pull that up. Well, when you know it, my my screen crashed. So give me 30 seconds to pull it up again. And I thank you for your patience. I knew technology. I have a love-hate relationship with technology. When it works, mm -hmm. I love it. So let's see here. Okay, almost there. Thank you for your patience. Yeah. Okay, so let me go back. Let me share my screen. Can you see where it says water? Yes. Okay. So we have up next Ms. Penelope Louder with Water. It is about 15 minutes that we'll be sharing with you today. And then afterwards, we will go into Q&A. So without further ado, Water. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Skylight Theater Company. Usually we're located uh, in Los Feliz on Vermont Avenue in Los Angeles. But over the last couple of weeks, we've been here online with all of you. So thanks for joining us. You are about to see the play Water, written by Penelope Louder. For those of you who don't know, Penelope wrote West Adams, which is on our stages in February. I'm so excited to be presenting this piece to you today. Um, there will be a Q&A afterwards with Penelope, the cast, and the director, so please stick around for that. And throughout the show, feel free to write questions or comments in the chat, and we'll get to those afterwards. We greatly appreciate all of you being here with us today. If you'd like to support Skylight or get to know more about our company, you can visit, visit skylighttheater.org. Okay, without any further ado, I present to you Water by Penelope Louder. Thanks for the water. Anytime, anytime, anytime. You didn't have to give me all of it. Girl, that is who I am. Do you have any? I got tap. Some of the bottles are busted up. Well, they should still be good. You were gone a long time. Supermarket's that crowded. Oh, girl, it is a madhouse out there. Savage is pulling here, just jerking stuff off the shelves. And, I don't know. Huh, the bucket up water. 
Uh-huh. Hey, Queen. Hey. Hey. How y'all doing? Hey. <laughs> hey, Rico, why are you looking like you work for the CDC? Oh. <laughs> what is that? Well, one can never be too careful. Girl, you too much. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? What, girl? I'm up in here, Corona. <laughs> What? I ain't got nowhere to go. Mm-hmm. I ain't got to talk to no one. Oh. Ain't no landlord at my door. I'm in here painting. I'm Facebooking my poems. <laughs> There's no landlord. There's no eviction notice taped to my door. Girl, I'm Corona happy. Tamika, what? Why you look like you're about to boost somebody's whip? I don't want to think about what's going on down there. Well, I'm glad you got the chance to join us. Mm -hmm. That's right. Sis, I am blessed and highly favored. God knows I needed this break. The COVID has had me working double shifts for 14 days straight, and your sister about to starve on his commissary cuisine. So let's get. What you got, Lee? I got a vegan Indian. Oh, oh. 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 man. You went drive through. No, you are too much. Mm-hmm. You are mm-hmm. a healthcare professional. That's right. I am an exhausted healthcare professional. Don't judge me. <laughs> <laughs> but you got Mika. Oh, okay, I got my spaghetti with my Mika bomb meat sauce. But I don't know. Yeah, girl. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to wear all that Miss Rona gear. Uh, yeah, I think we'll stuff off. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sometime today, child. Come on, I'm hungry. All right, all right. Yeah. All right. Okay, okay. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. What? What the hell? Hey, let's eat. What the hell happened to you? You know, let's not focus on me. This is Lee's lunch celebration, so let's raise a glass to Lee, who is uh, two years cancer free. Yeah. What you need to do is lower that glass and your face is all busted up. What happened to you? Lee, you said you needed water. Yeah, yeah. What did you do? Fight for it? You fought for water. What was I supposed to do? You know, Lee, Lee said she needed water. Hey, don't put this on me. I'm not putting it on you. You needed water, and I'm that friend that will get you what you need. Now let's eat. If I wasn't down for the flu, I would have got it myself. Just be grateful you got water. Mm-hmm. And don't worry about how I got it. I got it. I don't know if I can drink this water. Uh, excuse me. Girl, you better drink that water. I can't do this now you were in some store fighting. Mm-mm. Were there a lot of white folks in the store? Please tell me you were not out here fighting in front of a whole lot of white people. <sighs> what does it matter? Out here in these streets are real. I don't care if your grandmother's watching. You better mm-hmm. fight for something. That's but right. there is a civilized way to do things. We can't be putting ourselves out there like that, Mika. I agree with Kenya. Imagine you in a store fight. Well, if it makes you happy, I wasn't in some store fighting. If you didn't get it from the store, where did you get it from? Parking lot. A parking lot? Mm. That doesn't sound... That doesn't... Was someone in the parking lot selling water? No. You were fighting in a parking lot. Yes. Was it the store's parking lot? Yes. Uh, Someone tried to take your water? No, not exactly. You you fighting over somebody else's water? You don't have to stand in one of those lines, Lee. You've been getting all your stuff delivered. Are those lines to get into the store? It's just as long as the checkout lines. 
But that's when you have to be cool. Do deep breathing exercise. Find your inner yanla. Just remain calm. I ran out of calm. Watching people come out with food and stuff that I need? No. Walking out the store like they just won some prize. Mm -hmm. Look, I've been upset too and wanted to give some folks a beat down, but I take a deep breath and blow that, blow that hostility out. Get some perspective. Mm -hmm. You know the folks down here don't know no better. Mm. You work at customer service at LAX, Mika. You of all mm. people you know how not to blow your cool. Oh, okay. You don't understand the frustration of watching people have what you need. You know, they're giving you the middle finger with their full cards. Mika, I have been battling cancer. I watch people enjoy impeccable health. I wasn't mad at them, but mad at my body that it turned on me. I don't know how you did it, sister girl. I mean, I'd fight the world on that one. Hmm. There were many times I wanted to fight the world. I go for my checkups, still sick from the chemo, and got to wait for hours just to see my doctor. I can't just go in there and beat up the man because I think he me. But that's, this is not the same thing because you know no matter how long you wait, you're going to get waited on. Eventually, you were going to get water. Do you know how many stores I had to go to? I'm driving around the city trying to find the shortest line that could guarantee me the possibility that the possibility of getting some water. I went to three stores before this one, all of them empty. Be mad at the stores, don't be mad at the people. The people should know that it's not to take everything that it's to nail down. Yes, exactly. Like this dude, he walks out with all the water, toilet paper and food all in one cart. And he looking at us with the shit eating grin like, like we suckers or something. You know, I, uh, I must have blacked out because um. Next thing I know, his ass is on the ground and I'm pushing his car to my car, you know, water and all. I load up the car and he come over and, and we get to fighting. I mean, he got some of his stuff back, but uh, I got a case of his water, toilet paper, and some sausages. I jumped my car and I took off. Hmm. You did that? Yes, I did that. Did someone call the police? They stopped me a few blocks from the market. Were they the ones that beat you like that? No, nah, no, nah, it was from it was from that guy. They didn't take you to jail? Girl, with this coronavirus, they wouldn't let me get six feet of them. They wrote out the citation, put it under the windshield wiper, hop back in the car, had me pick it up. They ain't trying to fill up a jail with me. I still got to show for court, though. Bobo, no, you had the water. They didn't care about the water. You got a court date. Yeah, and I'm gonna need some people to vouch for me. What you need is a criminal lawyer. I know. This is not where we should be as a society, but this is where we are. And it's only gonna get worse. Especially when the money starts running low. I'm gonna drop this water off to you. You don't want it? You didn't pay for it. But she did get it for you. She did do that. I didn't ask her to do this. And I can't contribute to the kind of lawless behavior. And I won't contribute to that. Well, you're supposed to be my friend, ride or die. I am your friend. And that's why I have to shut down whatever this is going on with you. Okay, it's not like I left my house at 6 in the morning looking to fight someone. I didn't want to fight that man in the parking lot, but you needed help. You know his family. They needed help. There was no more water in that store. So you went in the store? No. There was no more water. Because I looked at that man's face and he had that smug, I got it all look. Just. Mm -mm -mm -mm. But you never went into the store. Why? Why? To be disappointed again? Shopping empty shelves because these savages took everything without any thought to anyone else? I couldn't go through that again. You needed water. He had it and he was glad that he took it from us and he wasn't going to give it up. And I wasn't going to go through that again. Then you should have gone. Well, what was I supposed to do, huh? Let you suffer? Resorting to violence doesn't make what you did okay. Tamika, we can't fall into that. We've already fallen into that, too. 
Mm-hmm. I was in the market the other day, and I had my paper towels and my toilet paper in my car. Now, I turned my back for a hot moment, and I turned back, and all my stuff is gone. No paper towels, no, mm. no toilet paper, and everyone looking at me. Not one person gave up that thief. They were too scared. I think everybody's scared. I mean, maybe she shouldn't have taken the water, but we are there. Mm-hmm. I know this is a Tamika. It's her now. No, I won't accept that. Nika, you have never once acted out of fear. <laughs> and you're not scared? I know I'm scared. Well, humankind is being tested right now. And some of us are working with the cliff notes, but the rest ain't even trying to study whatever this thing. We are trying to survive. You got that right. I cannot drink this water. Fine, but don't ask me for nothing else. Don't be like that. No, so Mika, you can't be all in your feelings like that. All I'm saying is if I take this water, the sweet woman that we all know may never come back. My ass took a beating today for you while your principals waited for your delivery. My ass is going to jail. No, oh, come on, sis, we don't know that. You can explain your position to the court. No, how, how, can, how do I explain that I got tired of waiting, huh? How do I explain that even in an epidemic, we come last? How do I explain that I don't have disposable income to buy what I need? Or that I took a white man's water because as a black woman, I was tired of seeing people get over while I stand in line, waiting, picking over the scraps. How do I explain my poverty even though I'm supposed to be operating as middle class. I just, I did what our forefathers did. They took from this country, took this country from the indigenous peoples and they used violence to do it. So I took and I used violence because I knew my friend who was immune compromised cancer survivor needed water. Tamika. (laughs) And thank you for standing by me. And I understand the intent, but I can't abide the act. But you're going to stand up for her in court, aren't you? I'll have someone return the water to your house. Wow. Me, Mika, come on. You know what? You want... I done lost my appetite, y'all. So you're going to wrap up your friendship with Tamika over some damn water? Are you being real right now, Lee? I can't. All right, that was Water by Miss Penelope Louder. Can we give her a hand clap or reaction of some sort? Hey, everybody, how are you? This is Michael Shepard, the director of Water. Oh, I'm gonna put Mike on, on pause. I'm going to share my screen, Penelope, before we get into um, Q&A, just to make sure we're all on the same page here, because now the floor is open for, you know, our questions, and I do have a few questions, guiding questions for us. Can you see my PowerPoint? Okay, so uh, we've seen... uh, three amazing pieces of art and you know some of the themes relate to uh what does it mean to be a a black person in the african diaspora we also see uh, ideas about identity themes of art 
and and your play, your films as media artifacts with people, um, they, people addressing the day-to-day -day challenges of living as a person of color, black person in the African diaspora. So we see things about culture, power, intersectionality, social justice. And I would like, you know, based, based on our group here today for us to have a really open conversation discussion where maybe you can tell us about how your projects originated, uh, what are your intentions for your art in general, and specifically the piece featured here, and what does it mean to decolonize critical media literacy? Specifically, how does your play or film attempt to decolonize and you fill in the blank? Because what's really important here are the stories, the stories of people in the African diaspora, those stories that are often neglected in the critical media literacy canon. So I see you all bringing those stories to light and using your art as a part of critical media literacy. And so with that said, I want to open up the floor for questions, whether it's in the chat box, whether you want to unmute your mic. Um, but if we could start with the first one, which is tell us more about how your projects originated. Who would like to take the first one? I'll, I'll, I'll go. <laughs> I'll go. Um, how did my project originate? Um, it started with me standing in line at a store in, um, at Vons on Pico and Fairfax. So I'm standing in line along with everybody else. And there's this guy that comes out um, with a full cart of toilet paper, water, food, and he has this smirk on his face as he's wheeling his cart by us. Like, you know, suckers. Like, look what I got. And his chest was puffed out. And I thought, wow, you know, here we are in line. When we entered the store, we had to literally, you know, pick over scraps. And, you know, this guy is puffing his chest out like, look what I got. And I told this to uh, Alina, you know, I, I went back to the character on Friday, Debo. And Debo was this really tall, menacing guy. And I said, you know, this is when you need a Debo. This is when you need a Debo to smack somebody down, take his stuff and dare him to get up. It was just the attitude of entitlement of um, apathy. Um, and it smacked of colonialism. You know, we've taught you to be good boys and girls while I take everything. And it made me angry. Um, when I entered the store, and most of it was black and brown people, you know, they calmly were picking over scraps, literally, trying to make do with what's there, trying. To... So that's when I, I sat down and I, I wrote this piece. I thought, what if you had a young lady, young black woman, who knows she has to help her friend who has cancer, something life threatening, and yet, cannot cannot buy the things that she needs because of being paid, you know, not what she's worth and having to pick over scraps in order to save a friend. And she's at her, her limit. So that's where that character comes from. She's the Debo of the group who has decided I'm not going to adhere to the rules of colonization. I have to be good, stand, stand in line, follow the rules. She was like, screw it. I'm gonna do what our forefathers did. I'm gonna raid and I'm gonna raid with violence. And that's what she did. She broke the rules, she broke free 
from the mindset or the structure that told her that she had to stay in line. So anyway, that's how it, it came about this piece. It, it did come from a place of, 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 of rage, anger, sadness. Um, yeah. So that's how, how this piece came about, water. Thank you. Thank you for that, Penelope. Tiff Tiffany, Ebony, can you uh, elaborate more in regards to how your pieces originated? I'll, I'll go, that's okay. Um, so I came up with my piece about, ooh, six years ago, and it was kind of a personal curiosity. Um, I wanted to explore my own roots more, my own um, family roots, family history. Um, my mom is originally from Mississippi. My dad's originally from Alabama, uh, but they both grew up in Ohio. And part of, and I grew up in Ohio also, and then I moved to California in high school. And so when I was growing up in Ohio, it was mostly just black and white people. You might have people who are biracial, but when I moved to California, I was around so many different types of groups, you know, that I had never interacted with, you know, Mexicans, Asians, Indians, just so many different types of people. Um, and my dad's um, grandfather was originally from Panama. And that was something that I was always really interested and learning about. And I didn't really have um, any knowledge of it. It was just, you know, little bits and pieces um, and so when I was in California, I had a lot of uh, Mexican friends and Latino friends and I lived in New York at one point and I had lots of um, Latino friends who looked like me, but they were Puerto Rican or Dominican. And um, when I, I was in New York for a certain amount of time and then when I moved back to Mexico, I went to grad school and then I was interacting, I had some Mexican friends and we were talking about the history of Mexico. And I had one friend in particular who was Mexican. Her parents were from Mexico. She was raised in California. And she said that people will always mistake her for um, Brazilian or Dominican or something like that. And I said, well, because you have black blood. It was very obvious that she had black blood in her. Um, but she was like, no, no, no. And it, she wasn't, it, to me, saying it from a place of, um, disgust or anything like that, but she seemed like she legitimately believed that there was no black presence, you know, in Mexico. And I was trying to educate her mm -hmm. uh, on the fact that there are a number of black people in Mexico. And she was like, oh no, it's just, they're in the sun working a lot. And I said, well, how do you explain the hair? And she just couldn't really address that, even though she had really curly hair. And I'm like, your hair is not, <laughs> I mean, you have to think about why your hair is curly. You know, um, you have some black blood. So she really just couldn't, couldn't understand it, you know? And even though she was very open to black culture and, you know, she, we were aligned in a lot of things, but just personally, she couldn't see it. So, um, and then after grad school, I ended up, um, I was working on a project and I had to move to East LA and I didn't know anything about East LA, nothing at all, just stuff that you would see in the movies. But I was always curious about East LA just because, you know, it, it seemed bigger than, you know, what I knew it was. And so um, I was living in Loma Linda, Riverside area. And then I moved to East LA for this project and all of my black friends were telling me, why would you move to East LA? What is wrong with you? What, why would you do that? They, you know, they would you know, tell me, you know, Mexicans don't like us. Um, you, you're gonna be unsafe, something's gonna happen. I have friends, you know, they were telling me, uh, one person in particular was saying that they would not come to visit me ever if I lived there. And so when I moved to East LA, I had a really good experience. Um, but so, so this film came after um, I went to grad school again and another um, study. And um, it was really kind of to prove to people that there were black Mexicans who existed, you know, that there were people who were Latino, but looked like me, 
um, and that they were alive and well, and that this was a segment of people who were really invisible. So sorry, I was kind of all around the world with, with explaining that, but, but yeah, that was my inspiration for it. So. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you for that. Ebony. Hi, thank you so much for having me and for everybody for sharing their, their films. Um, I had seen Tiffany's before um, when I used to live in LA and it's not it's funny because now I live in Mexico and like seeing it now with like the amount of history that I know and stuff like it was just like oh my god yes I understand that now like oh yes yes and yeah so it was really like reaffirming to see your film again but um oh uh, yeah so I've been living in Mexico for the past four years and my I did this film in my first year in Mexico and it was part of like a, edit, a video editing program that I was in so it was my final project and it started because the whole time I was in that program, I didn't know like what I wanted to do in my project. I knew I wanted to do something about like cross-cultural and I knew I wanted to do something kind of documentary because uh, it was about anything you wanted. And I studied journalism in undergrad. So I wanted to do something like documentary and I was thinking about doing a documentary about um, like the Korea town that's in Mexico City. Because if anybody's been to Mexico City, there's like a really small Korea town um, in Colonia Juarez. And so um, I was thinking about doing that for a while, but then I was reading the newspaper, um, like the national newspaper in Mexico City, it would be kind of like the Washington Post of Mexico City. And it was pictures of, pictures of migrants at the border and all of the people in that picture were black. And I was like, what, there's more black people in Mexico? Like, uh, <laughs> and so from there, I kind of got really interested in like learning more about what was going on with the situation with Haitians at, at the border and also tying it in with the history of blackness in Mexico in general, because for me, it's also a very personal thing because I am Mexican American and black American. And I grew up in a Mexican American community where everybody negated my identity, um, negated the Mexican side because of this myth that blackness isn't in Mexico. And that's like a historical state project that institutionally erased black people from Mexico. Um, that like this year, I think someone had asked like if Mexico doesn't count um, Afro-Mexicans in the census, this is barely the first year that they counted Afro-Mexicans Afro in the census. So think about like all of those centuries where that, that's how, that it was erased and like barely it's starting to be more visible now um, in Mexico. And so that was kind of the reason that, that I wanted to do the film was because for one, it was like, I don't share the same experience of being a migrant um, and I don't have that experience, but I do have the experience of being a black body in Mexico. And that's kind of where I wanted to tell that story from um, and tying it in with like the greater context of blackness in Mexico, at least in that context of migration, um, because there's the other context of people who are, who've been descendants of people who were brought here centuries ago to um, that I've explored in other, other pieces, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> And, and thank you for, for all of your responses. Um, I'm gonna ask one more question and open it up to, for the group to pose their questions. Um, the theme of the conference is decolonizing literacies and thinking about your art as a part of uh, critical media literacy or critical literacies. Um, specifically, how does your play or film attempt to decolonize and you fill in the you fill in the blank. You give us more details about what your intentions are in regards to the decolonization process through art. That's a it, that's a very heavy question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when you ask me, I've been like really going through trying to figure out like, what are the definitions of decolonization and what are the definitions of, you know, all of this, you know, and for me, you know, like, you know, I, I'm very intimidated by Amina sometimes because she's so smart, you know, and so, um, <laughs> so, you know, just Listen, to... I didn't, I didn't, I didn't pay her to say that. No, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, just really trying to, and plus I've been out of, academia for a while. Um, and so try, just trying to get these thoughts back, you know, as to what this all means. But for me, it's really simple. Um, it was really just, just sharing the truth, you know, and uncovering the lies because academia is, is an extension of 
uh, this society which suppresses culture, which suppresses people, you know, um, different experiences. So um, it was really about making those voices heard. And I'm a writer and um, most of the, the writing that I do is really more like sales writing. Um, but, you know, being in higher education, you know, I've, I've had to write from, you know, critical theory. Um, and so when I was exploring this film, I was at USC for, for a journalism masters and we were able to take classes from different schools. And so I've always wanted to go to film school, but I was like, I don't know how to make a living as a filmmaker. That's very hard. So let me just take a film class because I'm at this amazing institution, USC. So let me just take advantage of this. And so the easiest thing that I could, I don't want to say easiest, but the, the most accommodating thing for my schedule was to take a documentary class because I didn't have time to really write a screenplay. So I took this documentary class. Um, I said, if I'm at USC, I have to do something that means something. I can't just do something frivolous. I have to do something that's gonna make a difference for someone. And so I prayed about it. Um, and I, I, this article came to me um, from the LA Times, which was about black Mexicans. And it had been something I had been interested in, again, just because of my own family history. And then because I had um, seen Tony Gleaton's uh, photography about the black, the African presence in Mexico. And so um, I just <clears throat> felt like it was a way for me to um, really showcase the people as evidence to show that they're living and breathing. Because if I'm writing it, you can get a sense of the importance, but you need to really see it to make a difference. Uh, because I had a number of people saying, oh yeah, I know, you know, I have black blood in me, but visibly they look like what you would consider just very light skin people. And so it was very profound. I felt to, you have to see this in your face. And so um, that was, um, yeah, very important. So for me, it's really just about stopping the suppression of a lot, you know, the, the suppression of the people, uncovering the lies, and the film to me was my way of showing the truth in your face that these people are here and that we can access them. And um, yeah, so it was just about really show, showcasing them. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. So it's, it's been moving, making sure our stories are heard. We may not get those stories in textbooks, but we are finding the truth and knowledge, right? We're no longer invisible. Right. And we're adding to the, the critical mm -hmm. literature canon, right? Through, through yeah. stories and storytelling, whether it's on stage or whether it's a film, the stories, those oral histories about culture and place and belonging, right? Thank you, thank you for that, Tiffany. Penelope, Ebony, do you, do you have any thoughts oh. about the question? Yeah, I, I, I look to decolonize uh, in the work um, uh, through showing women, especially women um, of African descent, Americans um, in this pandemic, because I don't think that was being focused on. Um, this pandemic to me did not include all groups and as to what it really means psychologically, financially, and culturally. Mm -hmm. um, I felt all of that was being not even looked at, not even discussed. Um, and that's what I wanted to do with this piece is to open uh, that discussion and for people to have that discussion on how this pandemic is affecting people, especially people of color. Um, it's not just about not having toilet paper. It's not just about not having water, mm -hmm. um, which you know gives all of us life. Um, it goes deeper 
than that. It does go back to um, enslavement. It does go back to Jim Crow. It does go back to all of those things um, when dealing with a pandemic, especially for those of, of color. Um, and I wanted to address those issues of how this pandemic is affecting people. Um, and that's not, it wasn't being seen. It wasn't even being talked about or discussed. Um, and what I found, what was really interesting is that um, during the afternoon, it was really interesting in the afternoon when people, mostly black and brown people, because they were getting off work and going to um, look for their items. It was interesting because they were so calm about it. It was such a calm as if, you know what? We've been through this before. There was no panic. There was no running around. There was no screaming and yelling. We've been through this before. We know how to deal with these types of situations. Our parents, our parents before them have prepared us for that. So I really wanted to show that, um, that, you know, being last in emergency situations such as this, I mean, we can go back to Tulsa. I mean, it just dredges up so much, this pandemic. But I, I, I felt that that conversation needed to be to have, needed, we needed to have that conversation, so. All right, thank you, thank you, Penelope. Ebony, any thoughts about um, this question? Yeah, I think that, because we always talk about like representation matters, but I think even beyond representation, at least for me and my work, it's also about empowerment and how can our art kind of help work to empower our communities more so than just seeing us on a screen, right? And like my specific work is a lot about like blackness in Mexico, black Mexican identity, things like that. My This is my first film. My second film is about Afro-Mexican identity through food and like some of the most common foods that Mexicans eat are actually from Africa and a lot of people don't know that. Um, and so uh, a lot of the, like a lot of the things that I like to do in my art is kind of center blackness in this types of ways. And like the most like, como se llama como cotidiano? The most uh, uh, like everyday things that we go through in life, we associate like, for example, with my my second film, Jamaica y Tamarindo, like drinking like an agua de tamarindo. Um, like how that actually comes from Africa and that actually is centering blackness and kind of my whole thing is like centering blackness, centering queer experiences, centering instead of just more beyond than, beyond inclusion, like I think centering our experiences is what I see as kind of decolonizing, at least in, in my, in my, in the context that I look at it through, um, because I think it's really important that since our experiences have been institutionally erased from the beginning of, <laughs> of colonialism um, in the US, in Mexico, and all of these other countries where Black people exist, I think it's really important to not just like include us in the conversation, but center us in the conversation. For me, that's that's the most important thing. Um, or that's like kind of how I guide myself when I'm doing my, my type of art. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Ebony. Thank you, Penelope. Thank you, Tiffany, for your responses. Uh, we are almost at one o'clock. I would say let's go to maybe one ten because I don't want to lose sight of our virtual audience here. They've been filling up the chat with uh, comments and questions and and favorable remarks. And so I turn it over to our audience here. What questions do you have? Please, please unmute your mics and, and let's talk. Any questions of our panelists? Hello. Is my audio OK? My inter internet's a little unstable. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, thanks for sharing your, your films. Um, I had one question. Um, as you as media makers, I was wondering what media makers in this decolonization process, what you find um, most harmful in media being made and how we can like combat that and like media we're making to not um, consciously or subconsciously like reinforce these narratives that are harmful to um, 
vulnerable people or in vulnerable places. Who would like to take a stab at that at that question? I have to think about that one. And just again, the question is about how to write work or or media that is not harmful to uh, those of color. Yeah, I think within the context of what we see in regards to representation, often it's not favorable. You know. Recently, somebody put on Facebook a textbook of black men being handcuffed in a sociology classroom. That's in the curriculum. So I guess, the, you know, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but basically what what is happening and what can we do to counteract those types of Im images and imagery? Is that? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Exactly. Thank, thanks, Amina. That's a great question. Um, I think for me as a playwright, I'm always aware of that. Um, I, when I was going to school and theater and, you know, I studied dead white guys, dead playwrights, white playwrights. That's all that I was exposed to in my, in academia. Um, and of course, some of those playwrights did not represent or present black people in a, in a, in a great light. Um, what I do is search for number one, the humanity. Um, I always go for that with my characters, their humanity, their vulnerability. Um, so often we are not, um, characters, black characters, Latino characters, Asian characters, Sometimes they're just cook, uh, cookie cutter cutouts, as they say, cookie cutter cutouts. Um, you know, some writers just go for the immediate, uh, the immediate stereotype or archetype. But as a playwright, I and I know many of my fellow playwrights, we go for the humanity, and what that looks like. It's not that the person has to be presented in. A, a picture where you know there's nothing wrong with them that you know they're 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 squeaky clean that's not what we mean by you know going for the humanity it means that they have flaws that they have not been able to to address it means that uh, uh, looking at their psychological um, health um, it just means forming a three-dimensional being that has the same foibles, um, loves, hates that anybody has. Um, I think Diane Carroll um, had this one quote when a, a white writer said that they just can't, couldn't write for her or something to that effect. And she said, just imagine that you're writing for a white person. Now it's not that, you know, she wanted to be a white woman. She was just saying, I'm a human being. Write for me as if I'm a human being. Not a, not a stereotype, um, but a human being. And that means running the gamut, but the most, most of what it means is vulnerability. That's what I love to go for in all of my characters of color is that vulnerability. What makes them, what makes them human? So. And I, to answer, um, oh, to answer, I really like what Ebony said about centering, um, you know, I feel like it's very important to use art to center characters that look like me, <laughs> you know, because um, when I'm creating, I'm, I'm thinking about what do I want to see, you know, and this was my first and last, I don't want to say last, but this is my first, you know, film that I've made. Um, but even when I'm just creating, um, you know, whether poetry or just stream of consciousness or whatever, it's 
And even if I'm reading something by a dead white male, for instance, I'm still, I'm putting myself in it. I always do that, you know? I, I read myself into the work. And so um, I think that that's very important to um, create and support work that um, centralizes characters that, that are beyond the standard. And even, you know, like sometimes on Netflix, you'll see um, different, um, you know, black movies. And sometimes you're like, oh my goodness, this is not the best work, but it's still just beautiful and amazing to see the images that look like you, you know? And I think the more that we do that, the more that we continue to kind of, um, you know, beat through that barrier, it, it normalizes us not even to dominant society, but to ourselves because we're so not used to seeing, you know, works and, and images that really look like our, ourselves. And so we're starting to see it more, which is definitely encouraging, but I think that it's very important to just continue having that repetition of representing ourselves. Um, so we don't always have to fight to show our humanity. Our humanity, like, I mean, people that look like me, that's my standard, you know? And I feel like the more that we do that, we don't have to always fight to show our humanity. We can show ourselves in so many different um, facets because we are human, you know? So, um, yeah. Thank, thank you for that. We have four, well, no, three minutes. Any other questions? I wanna make sure that, you know, we're fair, equitable with our questions and time. Does anyone else have a question that you would like to pose of our panelists? I see in the chat box, reminds me of the conversation we had about Uncle Clifford and P Valley. When does representation in media uh, Hollywood become humanized instead of exploitation? Wow. Yes, using art for you and your identities to finally be the center of life, reclaiming life in the midst of it always being taken. Amani, thank you for these films, very powerful and opened my mind to topics I hadn't put that much, hadn't put thought to before. So uh, apparently we're getting some great feedback and I thank you, I thank you artists for your time today. Any other thoughts or co comments before we uh, wrap up? And hopefully you'll go to your next session. Um, very thoughts? quickly, I, I loved what she was what she said about P Valley and having worked in television and film and Warner Brothers. You know, when you get into television and film, you have so many people to answer to. Um, they do studies. Uh, the studios do demographic studies. Um, they do the whole. Um, what is it, uh, surveys, when you bring people in and do you like this character? Do you not like this character? What is it about this, da, 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 da. Then you have the suits. The suits are up top and I remember, you know, getting the red line all the time. You can't do this, you can't say this, you can't do this and that. I think, you know, I think characters now have a little bit more leeway, but um, unfortunately um, with television sometimes you know, they have to stay within a box because they have to, they're appealing to, to the shareholders. You know, it's all political. And those that don't, that can get away with it, you know, that's, that's when, you know, they either have a lot of clout or they have someone backing them that says, no, you can, you know, you can get away with it. I think Issa, Issa. Um, Issa Rae. Yes. I think right. she, she gets, you know, she's able to um, move out of that um, because she's proven that her characters are something that people want to see. But I think initially, I just know from black writers, TV writers that are starting out, um, unfortunately, it's always stay within the box. I think that's interesting. Oh, sorry, one quick thing. <laughs> because it kind of goes into the first question of like, how can we be less harmful? Even thinking about institutionally, like who are the shareholders and why do we have to write our characters 
to cater to them. No, even thinking about how do we institutionally change that whole system of having more diverse people up top so that we can actually right. have more clout to tell these stories. And that's and that's what has that's to happen. Yeah, mm -hmm. it has to go more different people up top because even though they may hire someone that's of color, they stay still may have the mindset of a suit that you know of a white male that's you know you know um, that doesn't approve of certain things or whatever. They still may fall into that. Hopefully not. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, you know we can get some really cool people in there. But yeah. I am starting to see a change. Um, it's slow, but it's happening. It's slow, but happening. And on that, and on that note, I would like to say thank you so much for our guests, our panelists, our special guests with our virtual audience. Thank you for sharing your work with us today. Can we please give them a round of applause or some type of reaction? Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We, appre we appreciate your time uh, uh, coming out and I should say coming out virtually and supporting us. Um, make sure you um, see other sessions uh, and participate and um, we'll look forward to reconnecting again. Um, with that said, can I, can I speak to Raina, Harold, Ebony, Penelope and Tiffany, please? Yes. And, and Jen, how are you doing? My colleague Jen is here from Dominguez Hills. Yeah, I was just, sorry, I, I snuck in a yoga session between sessions, so like I'm all like disheveled <laughs> on camera, but it was so great to uh, meet you all virtually because I know you're coming to do uh, the, the uh, or a similar presentation with our students, so I got a sneak peek, so thank you. It was really great to yeah. see your work and then to, to listen to, to this analysis, and this is a little out of my field, so I was just taking it all in and, and learning from from you all. Yeah, that was some really great points made. I wish we could have explored the whole notion of the structures. That's a part of critical media literacy, the structures that are in place that maintain these types of uh, scripts, dominant narratives. Mm -hmm. That's also a part of critical media literacy, analyzing these these structures of Warner Brothers, CBS, all these conglomerates, you know? So yes, Ebony is coming to visit us next week. Uh, Penelope is coming to visit us in November. Tiffany, you're coming in November too, right? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, and then Ebony is next week. So you'll get to see, hopefully you'll get to see even more uh, participants um, for the session. Raina, are you there? You'll find that, I'll just say that it's just a, um, you'll find that a lot of our students are really going to connect and identify with, with what you're talking about. They're gonna be so excited. Yeah, Thank yeah, we're all we're all happy to have you come and speak to the Thank students. You. Thank you. Thank you. So let's see, Harold. Hi, Amina. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Hey, Raina. Rose is here. So I wanted to say to the artists, um, uh, going into the conference, you know, I made it clear that you know we we need to try to collect some funds to say thank you. And so uh, Raina has three artists. Uh, and hopefully you'll get a chance to see, I should say, Raina has two artists and I have one artist with Mr. Harold Lloyd, but it's the um, Fight the Power, Decolonizing Literacies in the closing session. So I share this with you that if you could send me an email with your cash app or, or Venmo, uh, I wanna be able with our collective, um, uh, collective group pot of funds to be able to send you a small token of appreciation for participating in today's conference. So if you could uh, send send to dr.amina.speaks at gmail, the email that I always use, and let me know if PayPal, Cash App, or Venmo your handles. So that way I can, yeah, because the committee, we collected some funds and we want to be able to share with the artists. We understand. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We, we live in a society. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And Raina, we want to say thank you, Raina, for bringing in those two artists. And I will be reaching out to them in an email unless I see them today at the closing session uh, to say to say the same thing that I'm saying here today, that we thank you for the participation and we want to give them a small offering. Well, that's much appreciated, Amina, but I already um, I already compensated them. Oh, you did? Yes. Okay. 
Well, that's good to know because I wanted to make it sh make sure we were being social justice. Yes, <laughs> and I'm sure uh, they would appreciate it. And I'm sure they'll tell you the same thing that I did compensate them. Yeah. Well, thank you, Rain. I didn't know that. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And Harold, you are welcome. You're very welcome. Thank you all. And I'm also going to say this to you too. I've been thinking about this idea. I texted uh, Raina yesterday. Um, I'm organizing people, the People of Colors Critical Racial Media Literacy Conference for the spring or the summer of next year. I hope that you all would be willing to participate in some capacity because I feel that there is a need for that within the canon of critical media literacy with a focus on critical racial media literacies. Mm -hmm. And what you've demonstrated here today falls within that framework. And so I'm hoping that you, I'll be sending out a call as I start to plan and prepare. Raina has already told me that she's down and I'm so excited, but I really do see this expanding nationally and globally because I also have peers and former students who are in Africa and Haiti and other parts of the world. And we wanna bring this home with a diasporic type of focus. So hopefully you'll join me next year as we have our first ever People of Colors Critical Racial Media Literacy Conference. Yeah. So what are your thoughts about that? <laughs> I'm definitely interested. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking yeah, about the cool. arts, <laughs> the arts, police brutality, yeah. dog whistle politics and, and voter suppression, right? Mm -hmm. It's so much that we can explore. And so I'm I hoping- I actually finished a piece with Laura Depp. They commissioned the 